Hey everyone, Stephanie here with creatingwithin.com and I wanted to welcome you to Candid Conversations with Teal Scott. I'm so excited that I had the opportunity to have a conversation with her and to share it with you guys. Um, this is very impromptu um, conversation. I was a little nervous um, doing this and so I, I'm having a hard time because I'm a little judging myself um, with the conversation because I felt like I was a little all over the place. But at the end of the day, I'm just really excited and really grateful that I was able to follow my highest excitement and that I went from one day just watching Teal to having a vision that I was going to connect with her and um, and I did and here I am and I, I feel like there's way more to come and this is just the beginning um, a part of my journey but I hope you guys enjoy the conversation I really did this more in mind with ten, uh, Teal fans already who are familiar with her work and are familiar with her story. For those of you who are not familiar with Teal, I will put other interviews on my website that she's done so you can get familiar with her background and her story. She's amazing. She has a YouTube channel and she talks various different topics on life and universal principles. She is completely awakened and aware and is just a really, really interesting woman. And um, I think you guys will find her fascinating as I do. And I hope you guys enjoy our conversation. Um, just heads up, the first nine minutes of our conversation, you're going to catch a little bit of audio and not see video because I had technical difficulties as this was my first time. But you live and you learn and I'm just grateful that I had this opportunity and I'm sure there will be more to come. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Ciao. What I wanted this interview to be is to give your current fans um, more of an insight into your inner world and then to um, new fans who maybe aren't aware of your work to understand a little bit about who you are and then we'll get into more of like the bigger life questions that people want to know. Um, but I wanted to ask you, so I know that with everything that you went through, um, when you when you finally escaped, you, you left at 19, right? And yeah. you're, are you 29 now? Yeah. 29. So you're so young. Uh, 29. So when I was really thinking about it, 10 years is really not a long time from living that reality to where you're at now. So I wanted to understand a little bit more of your process of how, how was that transition when you, you know, escaped and you, you started now when you were with Blake and you started with him. How was that transition to kind of get acclimated into, um, just having a normal life and even like being able to, to date because you were married as well. <coughs> so I kind of wanted to see how, how you were able to transition. My transition was horrible. It's kind of, it's kind of like everybody wants the story to end at escape and it, it, you know, all the movies are like that too, where it's like, you'll, you'll see somebody that's in an imprisonment type of a situation. And then the minute they escape, everyone's like, yay, happily ever after. And in reality, I think that there was, I had more times after I got away that I wanted to go back to the situation just by virtue of the fact that it was so incredibly unfamiliar to be in the rest of society outside of that group. Cause the thing that happens, even if you're going through torture, is it, you start to be able to expect what your reality is going to look like. And I couldn't expect what my reality is going to look like because I didn't, I was not acclimated to it at all. And I couldn't conceive of the fact that everyone around me wasn't doing the exact same things. So I had really abnormal reactions to my neighbors, even, <laughs> you know, sort of thinking that they too had people hidden in their basement. And um, back when I escaped, basically, you know, because sexual abuse was so much a part of what I was going through back when I first was with Blake and escaped from the situation, I didn't understand that sex wasn't like a normal currency. Because to me, it was. It was like if anybody even looked or acted nicely towards me, I felt like I kind of owed them that. And I had no attachment to my body whatsoever. So I, I didn't understand what was in a quote, societally appropriate and societally inappropriate way to behave. So, like, when I was in a relationship, I didn't understand that it was not societally acceptable for me to go have sex with lots of other people at the same time. Bobby in a relationship. 
So, oh, yeah. so how was it, though, to get in a relationship? Like, was that something that was weird for you? Like, were you able to... How was that process? Like, because just mentally everything that you went through to then be able to get in a relationship and kind of emotionally give yourself, like, do you feel that you were able to do that at the beginning when you first started? Hell no. In fact, I was only capable of using people. Men, specifically. It was not... Women were kind of a liability to me. <clears throat> so they so they were kind of out here, and I didn't have relationships with women at all. I, I was surrounded by men always. And I understood what men wanted, and I was very good at giving that to them. And I did not involve myself too far emotionally with them. It was just kind of a, now you benefit me in this way, and I'll benefit you in this way. Mm. So... <clears throat> the way I like to sort of put it is I was very comfortable with the kind of relationship where I was like an arm hang. So I'm okay with presenting this image to the world that makes you look good. I'm okay with giving you sexual favors and all kinds of other things like that. And, you know, mentally stimulating you because I'm intelligent enough that I can do that. But when it comes to, and in, in exchange, you're going to basically support my life because I had no idea how to take care of myself at all. In fact, it's still something I struggle with. So, so men sort of provided this buffer where they were, you know, buying me food, they were supporting my lifestyle, they were the ones that filled the car up with gasoline, you know, all these kinds of day-to-day -day things that go into actually having a physical life here. I did not feel capable of doing that at all. So that was sort of the exchange rate. So relationships for me in the beginning, and I still kind of am, I'm trying to transition out of that now, but relationships were much more of a business arrangement to me. Mm. I didn't feel like I could give my heart to somebody at all because, I mean, there were so many, I mean, it goes deep, but there was a lot of ceremonies that took place when I was a child of marrying me, basically, to my abuser. And so, in my mind, I was not allowed to form a connection with any other man. Everything since then would be a false marriage, basically, or a false connection. So, I tended to be very flippant with getting into relationships and flippant with marriage, even. <laughs> yeah, a guy proposed to me. I'd be like, okay, fine. It's not really going to count anyways. So I'll be your wife. <laughs> so how did it happen? Um, how were you able to transition? Like, did you did you have a period where you dated a lot and then... Because you were married for... Did you Weren't you recently married for a couple of, Like, six years? Six years, yeah. Six years, right? Okay. So how did that happen? Like, did you date and then you, you met your then-husband? And how, how were you able to get... <laughs> <laughs> Moment of truth. You ready for the yes. moment of truth? Yes. Yes. Um, no, because I got I got away and I went into therapy and I still was not feeling capable of taking care of myself and so my therapist with me basically this is the issue when you go in with a lot of ritual trauma like I had, it's kind of like you're looking at a list five miles long of things you need to deal with and so you prioritize the stuff that's the biggest problem. And the biggest problem on that list was definitely not my need to be in relationships and have no time without relationships. So it's, I was exactly the opposite of what you'd expect. I, well, actually, somebody who understands trauma would expect that, that I have to be in relationships. It's like, right now, actually, in my life is the first time I'm ever, I've ever explored potentially, well, I'll explain that whole situation in a while, but explored the idea of me basically coexisting with the world with nothing in between me and the world like a man. And that was inconceivable for, and it was not something which my, you know, therapist or me thought was really important compared to the rest of the stuff that was super important, like me seizuring, you know, stuff like that. So, <clears throat> so uh, how it worked is I ended up, because I've got major abandonment issues, typical of an abuse victim, I ended up on this, this one, um, it was like a Thanksgiving, my parents and I were not getting along whatsoever, and they had actually told me that they were more comfortable with me basically not having a relationship with them than bringing up my childhood. And I was going through this part of my, my trauma-based reprogramming, you know, therapy, where I really needed to talk. That's a really important step for, for anybody who's been traumatized. They need to tell the story over and over again, as many times as it needs to be told so that they can actually have it out of them because it's like a cancer that needs to be sort of bled out. <clears throat> and a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. My parents didn't want to hear about it, and so this one Thanksgiving they said, you do your own thing. And so I ended up by myself, and I, I was um, trying to not jump on board with this one relationship. It was a guy who basically had been after me for about six months, but I had been in another relationship. 
And the relationship I was currently in was a guy who had a Mormon family, and the Mormon family didn't want me coming over to their house for Thanksgiving, and so the guy I was currently with ended up going with his family, and I was alone. And that is all it takes, you know, for me to feel like <clears throat> I'm unsafe. And all it took for that window to open, basically, for me to be like, all right, I realize I've been avoiding you for six months, but now, okay, fine, I don't have anywhere else to go tonight, so I'm going to go with you up to your house. And his mother was awesome, and he was really wealthy, and so I felt safe for once. And um, basically, his family didn't like the idea that we were uh, dating and having sex without being married. So, <clears throat> so they ended up asking him if he would ask me to marry him instead, and he said yes, and I was married in three months that time. That lasted six months, that marriage did, before he annulled the marriage. And then um, I was, like, trying to swear off men for two weeks, and that didn't work. I went on a walk in a dog park and saw the guy I was married to for six years who still lives with me, but he walked up, and I was married to him within... He proposed in two weeks, and I was married one month later. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, definitely the issue has been how, how to be okay in the world without a buffer of some kind of man. Or many. Because that's the real story, is that, you know, people who are in my position tend to, to stack men. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, I'll have the current one, and then 16 backups just in case that guy fails, because I feel so unsafe in the world that if one of those, you know, systems fails, i got to have a backup type of thing. It's not something I'm, like, super proud of, but it's definitely my coping skill I've found in a loophole. Of course. And that's why I kind of wanted to talk about this, because I think that so many women, in regards to just, they have relationship issues, because maybe they didn't have the experience that you did, but a lot of them have daddy issues and self-love is a big thing for all of us so I know and and it, just as humans I think relationships um, aside from finance I think relationships is the number one thing that we all worry about and trying to figure out yep. you know how to make work yep. so <laughs> it's uh it's good to have that transparency that's why I want to do that because at the end of the day we all have we all have still stuff that we're working through yep. yeah I know I have a lot of relationship stuff I've been working through but um Okay, and so how was that process for you? Because I remember I saw one of um, I think I saw like a quick episode of one of your shadow works, and um, your your husband, your then husband, you you said you made a comment about how he changed, how he wasn't the way that he was with you. Um, so how what did you learn the most from like that marriage? Because you guys were together for six years. So would you consider that your most stable relationship at the time? By far, yeah. By far. By far, oh my gosh, yeah. It, I went from like not being able to make a relationship last longer than probably a year, and that was hard to that. So yeah, it was by far my most stable relationship. I think the number one thing is that self-concept is absolutely everything. I mean, I, I, I said that before, but it was kind of trite until I went through this marriage and then subsequent divorce before I realized that if you don't feel good about yourself, everything's going to go to shit. Let's just be honest. It was, and I, I, in this marriage, I ended up feeling absolutely crappy about ourselves. We got in a fatal dynamic, basically, which is that um, he is the kind of person who withdraws completely. And so we got into some financial issues, you know, because he, long story short, his family raised him with very limited understanding of finance. And so when when I jumped into the marriage, I didn't know where he was financially, and he was in a large amount of debt, and I ended up paying all of it off for him. But it was like the nail in the coffin because I wasn't actually, at that point, really practicing a lot of these universal principles. So I definitely self-sacrificed, you know. I got rid of my major nest egg to do that. And if I'm going to be honest about my side of the bullshit in this marriage, I honestly held it against him for the duration of the marriage. And so I started to feel abandoned the minute that I did that. And, like, he put me in the situation where I kind of had to make it work. And that means that he doesn't love me because he's not really providing and supporting me. And the more angry I got, the more he would shut down and get more passive-aggressive. And he would start resenting me. And then the more angry that would make me. And then the more shut down he'd get. And it was like this vicious cycle that we tried to break out of for a long time. We went and saw counselors. And did, you know, a lot of the processes even I teach, we did a lot of that. And 
there became there came this point basically where we had to be honest about whether this was really a problem of just this fatal dynamic, which can be recovered from, or whether it was in fact that we had you know wanted different things. Mm. So we had this very long conversation about the fact that he wanted totally different things than he said he wanted in the beginning and that being in a relationship with me is what made him know that he wanted different things. And that's how relationships are designed to work universally. So it's not like that's a surprise. Each new relationship is going to give rise to new contrast and that new contrast is going to give rise to new desires. And so you'll want things you never knew you wanted out of a partner just by virtue of being with one. And the same went for me and him. I realized that I needed a person who was an initiator and not so passive because I married a man who made me feel very safe because he's so stable. I mean, literally, my ex-husband is the most stable person I've ever met in my life. Like, nothing riles him, and he doesn't have any reaction whatsoever, good or bad. So it's like you walk in with underwear on your head, and he, like, doesn't even react. And so that stability felt good, but, like... You know, when we started getting into that dynamic, I started to feel like I was the only person in the relationship at all. And I need a much more dynamic, engaged person who's willing to kind of, you know, hit me in the middle <clears throat> when I rise up and do my thing I do, which is the insecurity dance, right? So when we had this large heart-to-heart about how we wanted different things, he actually wants a woman who, who will support him and his career, you know, and who wants to take more of an active role in parenting, and who is really super physically affectionate, which I am not. And I didn't really want any of those things which he had listed. So we realized that basically in order to stay together, we would be going against our own um, path of desire, against our own consciousness streams, basically. And so we made this very adult decision that we should live together as family still, so our son can have both of us, but that we would go off in different directions. That's a that's a really um, different perspective and, and more of a evolved way to, to to separate and to live to still stay together but not be together. And it seems like you guys have a, probably a better relationship now than when you were married. Oh my god, better is an understatement. It has scared everybody else because I live communally now. Everybody's just been like, "What the hell happened with those two? Because now it's like the minute we made that decision, it was super hard. I'm not gonna lie, I was crying like panicking, you know, because I'm thinking. Because I wasn't thinking it was going to turn out this way. I was thinking, oh my God, he's going to leave. And then, you know, what am I going to do with my son? I just destroyed his life. You know, I went down that path. But what has evolved has been so incredibly amazing. It's like the second we made that decision, we now get along. And we're talking to each other. I actually threw his birthday party yesterday. We were sitting out on the back porch and we were just talking about what girl he wants to meet. And, I, and then we started both laughing because we're like, this is so abnormal for how this is usually supposed to work out. But it's great because my son has his father. I have a really, really close friend now and, you know, slash family member in him. And our hope basically is that he will find a woman and either she'll want to go off and live sort of separately or else she'll become part of the communal situation. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That is, it's so, because um, you, you said something about how at the beginning you don't realize it, because I think that's what people um, don't really get when you're in the situation, when you're in the middle of what I, I would say, like the hurricane, the eye, you can't see what's to come, so in that moment, it's all you could see, so you feel like your world's going to fall apart. So, once you guys split up, how did your, in your in, around that time, you, you weren't doing the YouTube stuff, or had you already started? Did you start doing your videos at that time, or how did that process oh, yeah. come about? Starting the videos? Yeah. Like, were you Oh, were man, this divorce, I got, my divorce happened June 28th of this, this year, so oh, it was like. that's right. That happened right, okay. I had written this book, The Sculptor in the Sky, and I was starting to gain a lot of popularity based on that book, and I was starting to do these workshops that I do. <clears throat> where I stand up and, you know, the workshops, I stand up and I talk to people and I answer questions, and by virtue of doing that, it's this collective healing thing. And that was my step towards moving more into the public eye and less working with individual, you know, people. So when I started to do that, I ended up running into this group that, I don't know if you anybody watching is familiar with spirit science, but... but Jordan is the guy who invented this spirit science thing, and he's kind of a spiritual teacher collector. 
we like to say. So what he does is he figures out who he thinks has the very best ability, basically, to bring people into alignment with spirituality, the new age, this whatever it is that we're doing, the golden age, right? So whoever he thinks is the best spiritual teachers of his time, he basically in them and gets them to start teaching and so originally the idea of spirit science would be just this sort of family of super spiritual people all who had their own teachings and we would be going around in groups teaching the world and he, when he came to visit me here because he had tripped onto my information his suggestion was that I did a video bit on YouTube and so I we're battering around with the idea and I was like, Well what the hell am I gonna do? And he's like, Well what do you do in workshops? I'm like, exactly what you see me do in workshops. I just basically people ask me questions and he's like, Why not do that? People can just submit questions. I'm like, Okay, that's a super good idea. So I did one the next week and loved it. And then that's been going for a year now. It's amazing. And you've grown so fast because I mean, I got introduced to you maybe I would say when was it May, I would say probably May of this year. Um, and my friend had been following you since before, but even from the time that I've been following you, like you're just growing rapidly and I mean, you just have such a gift and, and it's amazing because I think that this is what it's all about. It's about awakening people and bringing them together and you just have such an amazing gift to do that. Um, so thank you for, for putting yourself out there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I'm kind of jumping all over the place because I just, I wanted this to be more of a conversation. And um, I wanted to ask you, with your parents, how is your relationship now with them? Because um, there should have been probably like a lot of healing on their end as far as they were very probably uncomfortable, as you said, talking about things. It's really hard. It's kind of something that I steered away from talking about because... I've had so many flare-ups, basically, with this. When I came out to the police and everything, then all this information was in the public eye, <clears throat> in the newspapers locally, and it created this huge rift in the small town where I lived, and then their, a lot of their friends, like, completely stopped talking to them and were really nasty about it, and they felt alienated, kind of like, by virtue of me needing to speak, I've destroyed their lives. <laughs> But they, you know, because now they, they get to face the sort of guilt 24 hours a day and it's not even their choice. That's my parents' issue right now, especially my mother. My mother's major issue with me right now is that they get their, their nose continually rubbed in shit and they don't get to be the ones that choose to do that. I get to choose to do that just by virtue of talking. So, so they hate it. They don't want to talk about it, don't want to hear about it. And they moved out of the, the town where they lived because of it and... I think it set them on this very intense spiritual quest because the only way that they have actually been able to deal with any of this is to get into Buddhism. That's what they've done. Both of them have become Buddhists and are so incredibly devout, in fact, that they are now in this coming November, they're moving down to a monastery in California. So, what, so spiritually, it's been a super intense one. <laughs> what's your take on that, though? Because they were in the Mormon, Mormon religion before, right? <laughs> No, my parents are super, super scientific. I was just, they just moved to a town that oh, was completely right. predominantly Mormon. So now they're, and so what do you think about them, them going more into the spiritual path of Buddhism? I think if I had to choose one organized religion for somebody to get devout with, it would be Buddhism. It's by far the one that I think has the, the teachings which are the very closest to source energy teachings if you're going to go with that sort of organized religion thing. And I really enjoy the fact that them going down to this monastery is an opportunity for them to interact with people who are on a much sort of higher frequency level. And so I feel like if, if my parents are willing to go to those really scary places within them, they're going to have some support to do that finally, and it won't have to come from me or anybody else. Because it doesn't get received well by me. It's a little hard to get your spiritual teachings from someone whose diaper you've changed. <laughs> But yeah, but our relationship is really hard. I mean, it's I sort of try to steer clear of really going there in the public eye as far as how difficult the relationship is, but I they lost their child every bit as much as I lost my parents when I was younger. I didn't really think they were my real parents and the amount of anger and rage and all those feelings that you feel at somebody not protecting you like you think they should, you know, 
it's pretty intense and difficult to get through. And I noticed myself slipping back into it, especially with my mother. Because we have a very difficult time personality-wise in and of itself. So um, I noticed that when she's coming here, I, I'll go through months where I'm feeling so good. And I'm feeling so high vibratory. And I'm feeling like, oh my god, I know exactly why everything happened to me when I was a kid. Oh my god, thank god I went through that experience. And it's like the minute she walks through the door. Classic of your relationship with mothers, right? Oh, I'm like a six-year-old kid again. I'm so angry. I feel like I've been abandoned. I'm back to victimhood. It's just like, oh my gosh. Yeah, but my, my relationship with my mother is definitely the most difficult relationship I have in my life. It's actually more difficult for me than my relationship with my abuser. Because it's easier for me to understand the, the reasons why that relationship went to hell than it is easy to understand why my relationship with my mother went to hell like it did. So we're trying to repair the relationship. They, they say that your, your relationship with your parents gets closer when you have kids, but really what's happened in my situation is that my, my parents are super close to my son, super close to my son, and we're still struggling being close. I think they see, they see my son as kind of their opportunity to do it over. Do you think that your mom, though, from, from your perspective, like I know that it's hard for her because of your situation, um, but has there been any times that you guys have been able to talk about, you know, like, does, does she understand, like, the bigger picture of it in the grand scheme of how, or she's, or it's really hard for her to even go there because... Yeah, she can't go there. In fact, she thinks that it's a detriment that me talk that I should basically do all this spiritual stuff but not tell anybody about my childhood. And it, she's, I think that they are still very much so thinking that it's going to alienate people more so than it is bring them in to the message. And I obviously don't share that opinion. I feel like what is so incredibly important. See, because I got, I've got sort of many different agendas. So I've got my spiritual agenda that that relates to basically everybody, regardless of what situation they're going through. But I also have this agenda as far as ritual abuse is concerned. It's very rare that anyone who is engaged in ritual abuse, as opposed to something like um, incest, goes out in the public and actually talks about it because of the fact that we're actually so heavily mentally programmed against doing that. It's literally suicide. And I've had a lot of people who, who are in ritual abuse situations that think I'm absolutely batshit crazy because I'm out here being so incredibly public with all this stuff. But that's sort of my whole thing is that I realize, you know, because when you escape from a group like this, you're essentially in hiding for the rest of your life. I mean, if you looked at my, if you look at the address that's on my ID card, it's, it, we will direct you directly to a police station. And I started to get really frustrated with that being no way to live. And I don't want anyone to have to live that way. And I know that the reason that this stuff can happen like it happens is because nobody talks about it. Yeah. So, so I've got this little bit of an agenda here, which, which I feel really good about. And I kind of feel like the poster child for ritual abuse now, but on behalf of all of these women and men who have been going through this situation with ritual groups that are so incredibly deviant, I am that person who's unwilling to shut up. I want to be the one who's out there being like, nope, this stuff happens. I'm not going to shut up. I'm going to be right in your face. And there are two ways to hide from someone. Either you stay behind the radar to such a degree that you're constantly hiding, or you hide by virtue of getting so damn famous that it's pretty hard to make you disappear without everyone noticing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, and, and but I think as humans, I think our, our our society and our culture as a human race, um, we, we're so afraid of the truth and of speaking things. We, you know, I'm having that transparency, and I think this is the age of where people are now wanting to be more transparent. And it is. I just I just feel that the more transparent you are, and the more that you can just lay your stuff out on the table, um, it just becomes so much easier. Like the, because I think we spend so much of our lives like with all these facade, all these rules, all these masks, and it's just so exhausting. And at the end of the day, when we think about it, who are we pleasing? Because everybody's just playing a game to please somebody else, but everybody's in the same like little rat race of yep. trying to prove something. And yep. it's just like just be yourself, just take the mask off, and and so that's why I love like just being able to have. Just those when you whenever you find those rare connections where people are able to allow themselves to connect on such deep levels and just cut the bullshit, <laughs> it, it's just it's amazing and and that's what it's about. So the fact that you're over here and you're putting the truth, it actually um, you're, you're giving light to it instead of um, you know 
hiding the problem and people think if you don't talk about it, you know, it'll go away. But Oh, I, I completely agree with you. One of the platforms of my teachings is that there's there's absolutely no such thing as a secret in this universe. And if you're trying to maintain a secret, you are literally wasting valuable energy. And it's been amazing even in my own life, just this I, this thing that I've done, which is to literally take this story, which, you know, should be really, sh don't ever admit to anybody you went through that kind of stuff, and been like, guess what? I'm splashing it all over everything. Not only that, all my current problems, I'm splashing it out there too. And it makes people uncomfortable, but it also gives them permission to do the same. And it's this incredible kind of freedom. And it also ironically makes you feel safer. Because the funny thing is, you know, people that can't use it against you if it's not a secret, they can't do it. I mean, just recently, I had one of my fans that that got really perturbed with me, and they put, you know, these they found these new pictures of me back from the modeling days, and they put it up on Facebook, and it was like, you know, in a, in a typical career for a professional, especially a spiritual professional, that would be like a, oh my god, huge deal, big moment thing. But it's like, guess what? I've already told everyone that's what I did. I've already told people I fucking prostituted. So if they put that up on Facebook, guess what? It's not like I haven't told everyone that before. So it was sort of like a laughy thing rather than being something that's really hurt me. And... It's so awesome to see what people do with that. When you're super, super open, people are tender with what you give them. I mean, you sh it's very rare that someone will use that against you because it's like, what the hell are you going to do if somebody's like, I'm going to kill you, and you're like, here's your ammunition. They're like, wow, well, now it's not so fun. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, because it, it's that transparency. When you're able to just put all your stuff out there, you're able to relate because people, we're so insecure, and we don't realize that we all have the same insecurities. So it's like we're all playing this game and then we're trying to outsmart and trying to make ourselves feel better by virtues of making other people feel worse. But then when you find somebody who can be transparent and can be themselves, it's like it gives you permission to be yourself. And one of the things I've noticed um, you know, through my experience in growing up is just the person who can be themselves the most when they walk into a room, that's the person who holds the energy, like the most energy. Because um, I realized, like, growing up for me, it was a struggle as far as, like, just keeping friendships and women, a lot of girls, when I was a lot younger, and I just didn't get it. I just felt so out of place for so long, and just my perspectives of, of the way that I saw the world, I just had so much contrast. And I got so depressed for a long time that I didn't want to be here. And it wasn't until something clicked in me, and it wasn't, I didn't have the, 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 the words or, like, the processes that we, we talk about now, but for me, it was just like, I just stopped caring about other people, and it was when I just started looking inside, and I'm just like, I don't care what this person thinks about me or what they say, I just have to look within me, because I gotta figure this shit out, because I have to survive, and it wasn't until I turned inward yeah. that I noticed that everything in my surrounding changed, and it was almost like, the less I stopped caring about other people, and the more I just cared about myself and being true to me, it was like, then people wanted to be around me more, and I was, it's like so weird now when I, when you yep. look back at it that it's like, whoa. But even for you, one of the things I noticed, and I was actually, I had mentioned this to Mike when I went to the workshop, was, you know, it, in your position that you're in, it's kind of a double-edged sword because you are such a beautiful and radiant person. So you're, you're such a magnet for so many types of people. You have people who are going to be super obsessed with you and I love you and ah and then and you have your really genuine people but then you're gonna have those kind of wishy-washy people who are gonna come in and want to get really really close to you and almost like every celebrity in a sense has groupies you know but it's yep. like and then because there was I remember when I went to your to your to your um workshop I was just looking around and um I was just telling Mike I was like man you know there's just some people who come around and just want to leech on to certain people it's just like celebrities they just want to leash on because it makes them feel good but then it's almost like they're just waiting till a little moment and they turn on you and I th that was yep. my experience growing up I had a lot of those friends and then all of a sudden they turn on you for no reason and you're like and then they make you seem like the bad guy out of any little thing they find a problem so I feel like you are experiencing that a lot and it's obviously something that's going to continue how are you yep. handling that Oh my gosh, I don't know. Let me do Am I going to totally mess this up if I go pee? No! This is okay. this is a whole candid interview. This is this is just relax. Let's do what we feel like doing. Okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to think about how I handled that one in the bathroom. I'll be back in a second. Okay, I'm going to drink some water. We'll be okay. back.
Okay. All right, I'm back. I admittedly have the smallest bladder ever. I'm surprised I can make it through my workshop sometimes. Um, all right, so how do I make it through things like that, which has been happening a crap ton lately? Um, <coughs> first step, I made really sure to surround myself with really super, what I consider to be super quality people. I mean, it's not its not like anybody is in and of themselves this kind of entity in the world that can exist separate of everybody else. Everyone lives interdependently, and so I'm no different. I've surrounded myself with a network of support, and it seems like the bigger I get, the more my support network comes in. That seems like a very universal thing. It's kind of like when you need it, it will come. So... I have a group of people who have actually moved to Utah in order to just be that support. And it's like the people who want to be leeches are getting um, pushed away on their own. They're becoming not a vibrational match. And the only people who remain are just literally I would pretty much die without them. M most of them are the ones that appear on the shadow work, you know, episodes. Um, <coughs> specifically Graciela. She's like I, she's like my happiness fairy. She's like this little marshmallow that just like is always supporting me all the time. So whenever I have major issues, I bounce ideas off of her. And on top of that, I have tried myself get super angry. So it's not like I immediately, if I feel this emotion, sometimes I do where somebody will do something and I feel nothing towards it. But like sometimes when somebody does something that really upsets me, I'll let myself get super mad or super sad and I'll let myself cry about it. And then when I start feeling emotionally better about it, I do this this very deliberate practice where I... Because one of the benefits of being in a position where you have access to multi-dimensions is that you can actually remove your consciousness from your own perspective. So I do this meditation where I actually remove my consciousness from my body completely and I put it down through the consciousness of somebody else's perspective and I interact with myself and I feel what they're feeling and it's pretty amazing how that just erases anger completely because I, I understand what makes people mad relative to things they're encountering is not understanding why it is incredible what happens the second you understand why something is happening it's just like immediately there's you can't have super negative emotion relative to it because you you would basically do the same thing if you were in their position so <clears throat> quite often with the people that have been doing this to me, I'll go down in their perspective and what I'll find is that they have basically they've been suffering enough in their lives that they have now developed a completely parasitic relationship with me where what they want is a super intimate relationship because that's what they have with me. With me, they have developed in their mind a relationship that is so incredibly close that there's nobody closer to them than me. And so what happens when they get around me and realize that a lot of other people want to be around me too and that I'm not giving them the perfect attention, most most of the time romantic attention that they want, then they perceive it as a rejection from me. <laughs> so <clears throat> what I find when I go down to their perspectives is it's not really necessarily even about me or not me or things I could be doing better. It's about the fact that even just doing what I need to do to do my job feels like a rejection to a lot of the people who are feeling this way towards me. And when you're in that perspective of feeling rejected by somebody, it's really easy to relate to wanting to seek revenge in some way. And so then when they do that, I don't take it so personally because I understand that basically them doing that is them moving into a good space. Emotionally, it feels better to them when they're in revenge than when they're in total powerlessness. So it's ironic. It's like at a certain point, it's very self-detrimental to applaud them for hurting you. But when you've moved up to that perspective where it no longer hurts you, it's easy to applaud them even for getting angry at me. So that's how I deal with it. Yeah, because... Um it's all, it's, it's all a matter of perspective. It's not getting attached to it, but um, I, you're still, you know, you have your process and stuff, but I'm, you're still in this human experience, so sometimes I'm sure that it's kind of hard, and that's what um, I feel like sometimes it's easy for people to, to not see that because they look, at, they look at a teacher, they look at somebody that they admire, and then, you know, um, they see the videos, and, and it's so easy as humans, like, we love to put things and people on pedestal and just not forget that, you know, at the end of the day, you're still in this human experience. So you're still dealing with everything that we're all going through. It's just that you have 
different perspectives and the way that you handle it is different. They call it Santa Claus com complex. Santa Claus. I, I ran into that a lot, actually. The group who came to move here had that, too, where they moved here and they expected that, you know, oh my God, the, living with Teal Scott must be like magic 24 hours a day, and they didn't really realize that, obviously, if I wasn't also going through contrast, I would not be physically incarnated. So I really feel, though, that this is one of the most important things, is for people who are who are the spiritual teachers in positions like I'm in to, to pull down the veil which we all stood behind for so many years because it's not actually beneficial. You know, people want it because they have a difficult time. Humans in general have a difficult time grasping nuances. They can't grasp the grayness of a person. They want either black or white. You're either enlightened or you're not. And it, the truth of how this reality works is never black and white. It's very gray. It's that, you know, people, someone like me, spiritual teachers, quite often are these beings who have two very distinct sides that they're that now our goal is to try to marry these two sides but most of the time the only side we show to the public eye is the one side and then people come to live with us and then they see this other side and they say oh my god it's a fake it's a fraud you know but the reality is that that's how all spiritual teachers are without exception they are beings who are trying to marry a much higher perspective with the perspective that you hold as a physical human which is Freaking difficult, especially when you participate in the human society we've got going. Absolutely. It's kind of like swimming downstream in an upstream system. So it, it gets really super complicated. But I feel like even though it's difficult for people to grasp nuances, grasping nuances is really the next step in evolution for the human mind. It's when we set ourselves free. It's when we start feeling good about ourselves. Because we condemn other people for being not black and white, for not being all good. But at the same time... We feel inadequate in ourselves because we know that we aren't. Like, no person can honestly look at themselves and say, no, I'm completely 100% exactly how I want to be, end of story. Okay. We're all like a work in progress, and it's no different whether you're teaching or whether you're learning. So, <laughs> so I feel like when we see ourselves more as this a dynamic force which is always evolving, we're going to get a lot healthier than if we sort of condemn ourselves for not, not being static, enlightened people you know <laughs> what for you what is the difference between um, <coughs> intuitively knowing something and and versus creating it because you know we create our own realities but at the same time um, how do you how do you tell the difference between something that you you know that you can predict and you're like oh I knew that was gonna happen and then did I create that or did I know it like did you pick it up intuitively or did you create it like does that make sense? There's no, yeah, but there's no difference. No difference. Yeah, because because your intuition is always the in, it would always be the indication of something you're already in the process of creating. So if you get the intuition that you're lining up with a car crash, that means you're already in the process of creating that. Let's maybe change our minds. So your intuition is always about what you're creating. So you can't really separate one out from the other. That's interesting. Never, I never looked at it from that perspective. <laughs> What about with people? Like, let's say if if you meet someone and and it's not a judgment, but you just feel a certain energy about them, and you're and you feel a certain way. Are you is that are you picking that up, or are you creating that, or is that a judgment? Um, it's a little of all of that. The reason the reason that I keep saying that it's not super important to know whether what what is what is because if you walk into a room and you have a perception and let's say that your judgment is that is about somebody it's an important emotion or thing to look at and if it feels negative and your mind tells you okay it would feel more positive to me this feeling if I went up and said something to them like oh I really sense that you're lonely you know and I'm really here for you then even in doing that, you have changed the vibration in your own self, so you're on a different creation path, and potentially you've catalyzed them into another creation path, and so it was beneficial regardless of whether it was just a, per a true perception or like a full-on projection. You could not line up with that experience if it was not meant to be a part of what you are meant to create here. And so your emotions are always reflecting to you what thought patterns that you're perceiving are important to engage with and the ones that aren't important to engage with won't register so there's no need to talk about them. <laughs> so 
in that perspective, would you, so I, when it comes to psychics um, and people who do readings, they're just reading a, a vibrational state because there are probable realities. So depending on the decisions, they can tell you X and Y is going to happen. But depending on the decisions you make, you can, you know, choose a different. Uh, Oh, hell yeah, but it's like, it's like so easy to do. It's so easy to be a psychic because all a psychic needs to do is to have tabs on your current vibration and understand that most humans do not take control of their own thought. It's ironic because here we are in this sort of community of people that really care about changing the way they think and thus changing their own lives and changing their reality and really taking the reins, right? And so we're dealing with a demographic of people who are in this group, Mind Creates Reality Group, that change their future like on a day-to-day -day basis. And it looks a lot different, you know, for me, looking through scrolls of people's potential life paths, when you're working with a group of people who are at least a little aware that they create their own reality and are interested in that, then they are deliberate about the thoughts they think, and, and thus it's like pretty dumb, actually, to even say that you can predict something that's going to happen to them because they change it so quickly. But the average person, so let's just say you go sit down at McDonald's and you're across from a person who hates their job, they've hated their job for 20 years, they don't really know that they create their own reality, they're just going through the motions, they're a real part of the machine. Those people don't actually take the initiative to change their thought patterns enough to change what they're matched to in the future. So it's so damn easy to predict what they're going to line up with. It's pretty much sickening. But it's not because their reality is any more fixed than anybody else's. It's just the fact that they don't take initiative to change their thinking. <laughs> but, but, and then what's the perspective on, on the person who, who's reading, like the psychics who have certain abilities or, you know, they, they can see and they can sense and maybe aren't so... Because just necessarily the thing I've noticed, because I've had, you know, through my growth, I've, I've experienced some different things like tarot cards and angels and different things. <laughs> But I've, I've noticed, I've, I've taken note of different things, and, and just necessary, I was just saying, just not because you have certain gifts or abilities to, to read or to see spirits and things like that, necessarily means that you're in spiritual alignment. Like, some, some of them still don't understand that they create their own reality, because one of the things I used to notice that I found really interesting growing up was in my culture, my, my parents are Cuban, um, and around me, my parents didn't practice, but around me, um, Santeria was really big. Are you... Are you familiar with uh, the practice. So I was always around people who practice something, especially in, in Miami, there's a lot of that. But back then when I was in high school, younger, I've always been really drawn to angels for some reason. It was always like where I gravitated. So even though I knew about spirits, I always, my thought pattern when I was younger was always like, whatever I don't believe in doesn't exist for me. So I was like, I respect spirits, I get it, but it's just, in my reality, <laughs> you, know, you know, it doesn't exist. But I would always see like, um, the ter the readers that I used to that I would see I was like they can read all these things but I'm like their life is a mess I was just like I just don't get it if they have all these abilities so that's why I always stayed away from it and the only reason that I got introduced to tarot cards and I really did fall I have to admit I did fall down a path where I I went that's really what kind of started my whole mystical I I went out of religion and tarot cards what what got me into more of the mystical path because it was my mom was when I was 17 was um, dying. She was really sick, and for me, I just hit a point where I was about to get really depressed again, and I had already gotten out of a really bad depression, and I remember sitting in my room, and I was talking to my angel, and I was just like, I just have to know, like, if she's going to pass or not, because I need to know how I'm going to handle this, because I had already been in such a dark place, and I knew what that felt like. I was like, I don't want to go there ever again, because it's such a hopeless feeling, and I was like, I, I was like, I don't want to go there because I don't know if I'm gonna get myself out of it because your mind is such a, a hell. And I, I had a somebody who, who was like, well, I know this lady who reads cards. And back then, I still had more of a religious mind, still a little bit. So I was like, oh, they used to say that's like, bad stuff and evil. And then I went and I got that's I, I started getting really into it because the lady was able to tell me without me saying anything I just sat there and she was able to see that my mom was sick and that my mom had had all these problems and that she was dying but she was able to tell me then that she wasn't going to pass away and that in a sick surgery was what was going to save her and that's how it happened and since then when I was 17 that's what kind of got my interest and I kind of went down that route but as I've had different experiences 
Um, I've noticed too that not necessarily because they have those abilities, do they also, not everybody has a higher consciousness where they understand that they create their own reality. And so what is yes. that, their perspective like? Because it's real for them, like the, the way that they're interpreting their abilities and, and seeing spirits and doing cleansings. Um, so I don't, know, I, I don't know, I just find that interesting because we all live in different realities. So... Yes, I, being, and it's kind of difficult to understand, but having incredibly intense spiritual abilities does not necessarily an enlightened person make. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're a real mixed bags of emotions, and a real mixed bags of vibrations relative to different things, and so there can be a person who has a very pure vibration relative to, let's say, seeing entities and a really impure vibration relative to feeling as if they have power in the world. So here you have a very powerless medium. So it's, and it's difficult because, you know, I teach that one of the best ways that you can come into connection with your extrasensory abilities is to continue following joy, continue following what feels good, and then inevitably the more that you allow yourself and the more you allow yourself and the more you allow yourself, the more you line up with your eternal perspective and the more these gifts start to come in. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these people who already have these major gifts are in alignment with their eternal selves. It just means that they're in alignment with those gifts. <laughs> It's sort of like a surgeon is in alignment with being a surgeon, but their relationship might be going to hell. That's true. Yeah. Like some people are really good. They have their finances really in alignment, but maybe everything else. That's why it's so important not to look at somebody and you, you never really know what's going on behind closed doors or where their vibration is because they could be really good at one thing, but everything else could be um, kind of out of whack. And this is really, this is a good segue because I think this is super important that you brought this up because... We are in a time period as people where we're really being called to create our own religions in and of ourselves, our own spirituality, to come into our own power. And so, so many people search the world for the perfect guru or the perfect teacher to then sort of latch on to and to stay latched on to. And no matter what, if you do that, you will get disappointed. Because you're missing the fact that this is a person with a mixed vibration. I mean, you don't necessarily need your surgeon to have a great relationship to know he's going to do a good job on the surgery. And we have to quit looking at teachers like the only way they're going to have good information is if they're in a complete pure state relative to absolutely everything. People still have, are very good at what they do. People still have extreme value to you based on being exactly where they are, even if it's not in a pure state of perfection. So what we really should be doing relative to any kind of spiritual teacher or teacher period is understanding that we are the ones that control where we are and what we focus on and what resonates with us. So the only reason to sit down in front of a teacher and listen to them is because potentially they will say something which we will take. It's not that, that, that they're doing something to us. We're just saying, okay, I'm going to take that thought you just offered me and I'm going to try it on, and I'm going to see if it fits. Now, if it fits, that's great. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that awesome teaching. Now, throw out the baby with the bathwater just based on the fact that this spiritual teacher is not perfectly in alignment 24 hours a day. Because it's not about the totality of the spiritual teacher. It's about whatever value you're extracting from the person, and that's in our hands, not in their hands, see? It's in my hand whether I extract value from something you say. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like that. No, yeah, it's it's getting just the information and different perspectives from from different people and just w one of the things I used to say, which is exactly what you're saying, um, was I never, even though I I grew up Catholic and I tried the whole religion thing, and then as soon as I I was gonna do my communion, I just told my mom, I was like, I'm not going back to church. I just I just didn't get it. Not, a lot of the stuff didn't resonate with me, and I would question things a lot, and over time through my own journey I just realized like I could appreciate each religion and and get what I like from it but make it my own and so I never like after I went through a couple of religions I was just like religion is just not for me um, and I'm just like I believe in everything everything exists everything is valid it's just whatever works for me and 
I think that that's it. And so that was my perspective, like growing up. And so it's kind of what you're saying. It's just this reality is really what you make of it. And it's just there's no we get so stuck on what's right and wrong and trying to put all these rules and regulations. Just like he's up just whatever works for you. It's like we all these laws and abortion is wrong and it's right. And it's just like let people decide what's good for them and what's not. And it's like we can't we have such a trust like we can't trust ourselves. So everybody needs to control each other. Yep. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, so, so what I propose is much different. So what I propose is that each one of us sort of creates this cocktail out of our life. It's a very unique cocktail, right? So we're trying to, we're, we're making a mixed drink and all of us have different ingredients that work for us. So we take this bit from this teacher, this bit from this person we meet, this, this, this bit from the seminar we attended, and if we put all of this together, here we have my ingredient for a happy life. That's going to be different from everybody else's because what processes work for me are going to be different than what works for somebody else. Oh, maybe we use the same ingredient. Great, we get along in that respect. It's really as simple as that. <laughs> it is, but it's, 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 it's such a, duh. it seems really simple, but it's such a hard concept for some people to understand because when you're stuck in a perspective, it's just so difficult. Like, I, I remember just growing up that the amount of resistance I felt um, relative to the people around me. And just getting them to understand, like, um, one of the things that, I, that really got me when I was younger was what I noticed about religion was people who would walk around with the Bible all the time and they would, you know, give you lines and lines about the Bible. And then I would sit back and I would observe them in their life and they would do the exact opposite of everything they were preaching. And I was like, I had a friend, I had a group of friends growing up that their mother was like super obsessed with church. You don't let the girls do anything. And I got one of um, the two girls to go to this. At that time, I was, like, testing out Christianity, so I was going to a Bible study group. And she met a friend there, and he happened to be black. And they started dating, and he was a good friend of mine. And all of a sudden, her mom, like, had a cow and was, like, just, it was a, a huge fight. The girl was super depressed, and I'm just like, you're so religious. And here you are being so racist. And to me, I was just like, I was just like, I, that's what kind of like threw me off of religion because it was like everybody preaching you and wanting to sell you on something but then behind closed doors they don't walk their talk so what good is it <laughs> you know when you're discriminating on each other when we're making each other feel so segregated and so separate it's not it's not love that's not God mm -hmm. so yeah finishing up with the talk about like psychics and stuff like that um how what, what advice or how, what's your perspective on how can someone use that? Do you find, because I found some use in it. I'm in a different perspective now in regards to that. But I do feel that for certain, for certain people, depending where they're at, it could be used as a tool. Um, oh, yeah. And so how can they use it as a tool? But then what I've noticed is, because it's really easy to get <laughs> caught up in, one, you can become very obsessed with relying, like anything else, relying on psychics and readings. And then almost like sometimes when you become too dependent on it, like anything else, it messes up with your internal guidance system. Like, it helps you, it can help you get that clearance, but it can also, if you use it too much, can then mess you up when you, you don't know how to trust your own voice. What do you, what do you think about that? <laughs> I would say, I would recommend that anybody who's going to go see a card reader or a psychic already gets in the mentality that their information is not actually coming from the psychic. That it's coming from the universe through the psychic to them. And that it can come straight through you with no venue whatsoever. And that's, of course, the ultimate goal. So we should see, we should understand before going into it that using a psychic or using anybody like that is a crutch. It's okay to use a crutch sometimes until the crutch becomes the reason that we're not walking well anymore. So <clears throat> so if you feel like you need a crutch, then be honest with yourself about that and understand before you walk in there that that's what it is. And understand that it's not about the whole reading and that person does not actually necessarily have truth. And in fact, the universe might be testing you a little bit in terms of whether you have your own internal guidance system enough to know what's correct for you and what's not correct for you in a message. So a lot of times if you're in a, a major space of distrust of yourself, you'll be led to a psychic who will, who will put truths in with non-truths just so that the universe can kind of teach you to use your emotional guidance system to know what is right and not right for you. 
So if we know that walking in, then it will be much easier to be to keep your eyes open for that. I would call it the Kickstarter message. That is, I don't really know where to move. I'm feeling sort of stagnant, which is the best mentality to go into these situations with when you're feeling really stuck. So I'm feeling stuck. I go in there. Now I'm going to keep my eyes open for the one sentence. It's not about the rest of the reading. That one sentence, which is the real message of the thing. And when I will feel it, of course, you got to pay attention to our emotional guidance system. So when that psychic says, this is really what needs to happen right now, and you feel that sort of lit, lit up feeling, that, you know, that's the indication that the universe is just getting you your message. You have asked for it. It has come through a venue other than yourself. It could have come through you, but you chose to use a crutch, and that's okay. Now go do exactly what, you know, whether they gave you, I guess they, if they gave you some sort of a suggestion, go do the suggestion. Or take whatever necessary step you feel inspired to take after that. But it's the attitude we walk into the room with that's the problem. We walk in and we instantly take our power and say, oh, here, I'm handing it over to someone who knows more than I do. But it's, it's kind of it's kind of crap, honestly. It's like people who have extrasensory abilities don't necessarily know more than anyone else does. You know? Ultimately, we all know all of the stuff that any psychic or any medium says. And ultimately, we could know anything a surgeon knows. So the only reason you're walking in a room is because you're meeting with a professional who has literally dedicated their life to opening up the venue between themselves and the higher self. But we shouldn't be walking in there so they can be our venue to the higher self. We should be walking in there so that they can help us connect to being our own venue to the higher self. <laughs> Then the, the psychic itself also, sh if you don't have that perspective, it w should have that perspective. But the problem is a lot of times they don't, so you kind of get Yeah, so what you, what you do with somebody who's really shut down, this is why I really suggest that sort of thing of, of looking for the message and not even making it about the other person. Because you can get a lot of beneficial information out of somebody who's nuts. And I use that word because I, I'm being extreme with my language right now because I want to stress that you could literally meet somebody who is insane or meet somebody who is what you would consider to be the dumbest person alive, and you could still learn something from them. It's because every being in existence is a mouthpiece of the universe. They're mirroring something to you. So if I'm in a really smart space, I'm going to not make it about this other person, this psychic versus this psychic. I'm going to make it about me being open to receiving whatever message I'm going to receive it, it in and quit thinking about what package it needs to come in. So, you know, I'm the kind of person who will go to a, what I would consider to be a... Okay, so what I consider to be a not-so-good psychic, right, is somebody who is severely out of alignment, doesn't know what that alignment is, because you'll meet people who are more like myself that are actually capable of getting out of their own ego mind. My goal is to marry the ego mind with the, with the spiritual mind. But people like me can get out of the ego mind to such a degree where I don't even relate to my own perspective here in the human self. So those people provide some of the best sort of psychic advice because they literally are removed from human existence in that vibration. It's just like somebody who's learned to levitate. I, we learn to get to a vibration and be in that vibration to such a degree that we lose the perspective that is limited by ego. You'll feel that kind of person because they will feel um, like they're on such a high vibratory level that you can trust yourself with that. You'll literally walk in the room and be like, oh my gosh, you know. So so that would be my number one suggestion. But the, even the people that I would consider to be the super not good ones where you're like, oh my god, this person is like drowning in shadow aspects. I can feel that kind of icky energy. But I'm still going to sit here and remain open to it. Why? Because, you know, it's really a judgment to say that nobody has anything valuable to say. And they're still a mouthpiece for the universe. So they're still going to mirror something that's valuable, no matter who it is. <laughs> um, somebody had asked me this the other day, and I don't know if it kind of makes sense. I didn't know how to answer it. Um, do you know the di what's the difference between knowing and a belief? I love you've got these, these you've got all these questions which really lead to the same thing, which was which is that the, the difference between knowing and belief is basically nothing because belief is knowing. So, there was really no difference. But the thing, the thing is, that when we're talking about true universal knowing, that's only the byproduct of getting into alignment with your own joy to such a degree that you can start to notice 
when your own heart kind of backs up from things or moves forward towards things. That's the only way that I have to relate that feeling. It's, it's resistance or allowing, but internally that feels like this doesn't feel so good, feels like prison, or this feels super good, feels like opening, right? And you'll start to notice that that will happen when you speak about things that you say you believe, your heart will back up from it. That's how to know that it's, you know, if we're really going to talk in terms of this language, knowing versus belief. But what's interesting is, knowing is so based on what we currently are thinking, the thoughts we currently are thinking and the reality we're currently looking at, that a person who like truly believes in Jesus Christ does have a true knowing. And they may look at you and say, look, I know that your salvation will happen through Jesus Christ, and they're up from it. Because their perspective is so in alignment right at that moment. But you'll notice that the more that you change your thought patterns, the more you change the proof you're looking at, the more you start thinking different thoughts, now suddenly your heart will align with much different things. You ready? So I have a principal guide talking. Would you like to know what they want to say? Yes. Okay, what they're saying is that basically knowing is the thing which will start to emerge when you start to work through beliefs. I'm actually directly translating right now, so we'll go verbatim, ready? All right, so what's being explained to me basically right now is that when, when, you're, when you're messing around with your beliefs, which is what we're really talking about, so I'm going to explore the other perspective, or I'm going to question my beliefs, or whatever. Anytime you do that, true knowing is what emerges as a byproduct of doing that. So it's kind of like this knowing will constantly sort of evolve. We don't want to use the word evolve. What they're saying is more like it's going to crop up more and more through the surface, kind of like a plant that's coming up. The more that we move away all of the beliefs that are in front of it. Huh. It's awesome. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank them. It's beneficial sometimes when they jump in and, you know, because, like, sometimes they, even from where they sit, they have a, a higher perspective about what it is, you know, the answer it is that's going to help you understand, right? Right. So, yeah, it's pretty fun. <laughs> so, actually, now that you mention your guides, is that something, um, have you always been in touch with your guides or is that something that developed at a certain period? So, early on when you came into experience, I know you've had the awareness. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've always seen, you know, I've, they've always been everywhere. In fact, my, my principal guide feels more like my, my parent than my actual parent does. Because, you know, being able to see, visually see the world that I see it, there's not that difference between physicality and non-physical. So it, it, it was actually really hard for me when I was, like, in grade school to learn the difference between one and another and to learn how to engage with without looking at the rest of the beings who are in the room. That was really super hard. And, like, I, I have so many vivid memories of sitting in my crib and, like, watching my principal guide, you know, walking around the crib and peering over the top of it. It was just as real as it would be in another physical being. It's just that they hold a different frequency than physical human beings. So that's what keeps me in right now in terms of what to pay attention to and what not to pay attention to. But it is definitely a balancing act still. <laughs> And what about what about um, what about angels? Because I've always had a, a huge, I don't know, drawing since I was really young, and even, like, I didn't know anything about them, like reading books or anything. It was just guardian angels, just like. And I know that they hold a different frequency too. Do you do you believe that, or from your knowing, that we all have like a guardian angel or an angel that? Yes. Okay. We call them high order light beings. They tend to be more, more, well, I just speak to you. You have quite a few. Right now, even behind you, you have six primary angels, as you call them, which we would call a high-order light being. And you will see more of these high-order light beings around people who are meant to influence larger numbers of people. Because it's more important when you influence large amounts of people for you to be in alignment. And so they're aiding you to stay in alignment so that your message stays in a place where it's going to aid many people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's that's amazing. Um, thanks. <laughs> um, I got a little choked up there. 
Um, yeah, I don't know what it is. I just have such a fascination. I wouldn't call it, I guess it's just our natural state, but I just love, um, as I love this human experience so much, and I call it, I, I want to merge the heaven on earth because I do love all the human aspects of it, but I also love so much of just the unknown and, and, and you know, I'm not so much like, I, I have a fast, I do appreciate like other extraterrestrials and stuff like that, but just overall just the, the the mystery and the beauty of the unknown and then our physical reality it's just so interesting and it makes i think without it i always used to say without that perspective i don't think i would have enjoyed this human experience as much <laughs> in this incredible <laughs> <laughs> but i'm blabbing um so okay so i'm jumping around but it doesn't matter this is, we're just gonna go with it um do you think that Falling in love can be a conscious act. Like, you can love someone, and there's people who, there's unconditional love is the highest level of love for us to want to attain. But do you believe that you can love someone, but then, you know, you're not in love with them, but can falling in love be a conscious act? Can you? Yes. Falling in love can absolutely be a conscious act because that feeling of falling in love is all about vibration and you control your vibration with your thoughts. So if you changed the way that you looked at someone, changed what you were paying attention to, to such a degree that you were only paying attention to the things that you absolutely adored about that person and literally not taking note of anything else, you would fall in love with so many people a day. I mean really in love, not a little bit in love. Because that's what people, people think your twin flame is only that one person and that can't be helped. But I'm not kidding you, you will have that feeling towards the guy who works in the deli and that feeling towards the person that drives the taxi and it is like it's the most intense thing ever. And when you when you experience a sort of utopian society, you, the societies which have evolved into a much higher consciousness, that is the baseline of how everyone interacts with each other. That is the feeling that each being has towards another being. That's the feeling you and I would have towards each other right now. The only reason it feels so, oh my god, earth shattering, is because it's so abnormal for us. Mm. So that when that person walks in the room and your heart hits the floor, it's like, oh my god, can I ever see the contrast between where I usually am and this feeling? But there are societies that exist where that is the normal feeling. Mm. And it is a byproduct of conscious focus. What about attraction? Somebody that I was having, because I, I just had that conversation with my boyfriend and I, and we were redefining that and um, about, you know, that it, it's a conscious act. And um, I was talking to somebody else, and they had mentioned, well, attraction is not a conscious act. Like, the fact that you're attracted to somebody. And I was trying to debate that. Is that something that either you're attracted or you're not thirsted, or there's no in-between? Both of you won the fight, won the fight, right? Do I? This is why. So, so you are completely right in terms of the fact that when you focus on on something, that dictates where your vibration resonates at, and where your vibration resonates at dictates what your point of attraction is. And by attraction, we mean who is drawn into your experience. And when you feel that, uh, what we are calling attraction. It's because the person who's walked through the door is so much a mirror for where we currently are that we feel that intense magnetic pull by virtue of law of attraction. So while that could be a subconscious thing and you can't force it because it just is, the only reason you're there in the first place is because of the way you're focusing. So it, you, it can absolutely be a conscious act, which is leading to a, a default of you ending up with someone that you are mirrored exactly by. The person who you, quote, fall in love with, who you're attracted to, is your most large mirror. So it's the, per, it's the person on planet Earth right now, if you're in sharing their space, who is going to be the biggest mirror for you, is going to be the, the best, highest vibrational match. It's that next puzzle piece. So the only th we're we're just emotionally registering what's happening on an energetic level, which is that the universe is bringing us together with somebody who matches our vibration the most closely. And then the physical, and because I think also physical, at least I know men are more visual, but um, the physical aspect of it. Because I know, like when I've fallen in love, like when I look at my first relationship, I was like, and after I was out of it, I was like. He was never like somebody ideally that I would pick out of a crowd and be like, oh, yes, you, you're so hot. 
So I don't look at when people ask me a type, I don't have a physical type because I think once you fall in love, then all of a sudden this person becomes so gorgeous and you're like, and then when you're out of love, you're like, what did I ever see in this person? So it's because, because of focus. focus. Mm-hmm. So, so one of the, yeah. we are always sort of in tandem with our bodies. And one of the things happens here, <clears throat> when our focus makes it so that we vibrationally line up with somebody, so we're a total perfect match to them right now, what happens is that it creates a cascade within your body of attachment hormones. So that's so the attachment hormones that are going through your body are the physical representation of the magnetic pull that's happening on an energetic level when someone's a vibrational match to you. And so then you start feeling and and, the, and the, here's so here's the loop, ready? So once you get those attachment chemicals, that's the bonding chemicals. That's the oh my god, you smell good to me. Oh my god, I love the angles of your face. Right? When you're in that sort of a space, then that actually forces focus. So we're in this kind of a, a snowball, which is quite subconscious for people most of the time. We don't know why we've ended up being attracted to this person, but now that we are, our hormones are forcing us to focus positively towards this person completely. That's part of how we propagate our species. Mm-hmm. So, so now I've got complete p- p- positive focus towards you, and you look like the most gorgeous person in the universe to me. But pretty soon... After after I, you know, by virtue of just being with you, I'm going to change my vibration a bit. I'm going to start thinking different thoughts because you've caused that within me. And when I start thinking different thoughts, now suddenly you're going to start providing a little bit of contrast for me. And now if I start focusing on that contrast, I'm going to start noticing more and more things I don't like about you. And when I notice more and more things I don't like about you, I'm going to start noticing more and more things I don't like about you. Pretty soon, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. You're ugly. <laughs> See? That's how relationships go. <laughs> Definitely. It's really funny to me. I think that the bonding within the human species is one of my greatest fascinations, for sure. Me too. I, I agree. It's very funny. So, so by virtue of you but can't focus. No, but it's sloppy focus. focus. That's all it is. Yes, that's what I was going to say. So by virtue now, because the perspective I'm gaining recently is like, okay, well you can consciously then focus on making a conscious act of falling in love with somebody who is a really a vibrational match to you, then maybe you weren't looking at them, but if you start putting that focus on it, you can, and they would be actually a better match than just allowing this kind of like unconscious, oh, just because I'm attracted to you or... Um, yes, you could hypothetically, for sure, but if you were d- going to go about doing that while simultaneously thinking the thought... I'm going to force myself to fall in love with this person. You, your, your body would register that you're lying to yourself. And so it would be a very discordant vibration to maintain. And it wouldn't work just because of that one focus that you weren't actually pulling into alignment with positive focus. Does that make sense? So then you'll see a lot of people be like, I don't know why. I just can't make myself fall in love with this person. Yeah, because guess what every other thought is? Oh, I like his nose. Oh, I'm trying to make myself fall in love with him. Oh, I guess I like his cheekbones. I'm trying to make myself fall in love with him. Gosh, he's nice. I don't like trying to fall in love with somebody. So so that's the most dominant thought, you see? So you, you have to take that thought out <laughs> and focus on just allowing it to develop naturally and just focus on the positive aspects. Yeah, that's, that all, that's all it is. Yeah. You can't push yourself sideways, so it should just be, look, it's my dominant intention with every person and everything that I see to look for that which I am wanting to see, to look for that which causes me positive emotion when I'm looking at it. And if you were to look at everything with that kind of a lens, so to speak, your world would look quite beautiful to you, and and other people would look beautiful to you, and you wouldn't have that issue where you're like, oh, I'm just... I'm just not attracted really to anybody. Yeah, because if you were paying attention to what you're actually thinking, you would see why. See, if you're focusing negatively towards somebody, chemicals that you associate with attraction to be born within you. Those are the byproduct of focus. So those of us who are on, on a speeding train wreck to hell with our current relationships need to switch our focus relative to our partners. And what's ironic is, if you really don't want to be with the person, and you try to switch your focus to focus positively towards them, that's your indication that you guys should probably not be a match anymore, and you're probably holding yourself together by virtue of resistance instead of by virtue of allowing the other person. 
I don't think humans are prepared. I mean, it's totally fine to desire a monogamous relationship that lasts forever. A lot of people desire that, desire that and that's fabulous. There's nothing less evolved about that or more evolved about that. It's just a personal choice. And if that is your desire, the universe has the wherewithal to line you up with somebody who wants the same and is capable of the same. But we run into this issue, which is that humans seem to think that we are in intended to come here and find that one person and stay with them forever. When relationships are the heart of expansion and new relationships are even more so the heart of expansion. And so, you know, we tend to hold ourselves a match to relationships that aren't actually causing our expansion by any other means than causing us so much contrast that we're kind of forced to come up with what we'd want instead. And we never let ourselves line up with it, and then we get sick, and then we die, and we wonder why. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions, and because I know that yeah, we've been talking for a while, but um, what is your... I was watching a documentary the other day on Asperger's disease, disease huh? um, and so I was thinking, what, what the, people with Asperger's are really highly gifted, but they're, one of the biggest things is just that they're not empathetic as far as being able to connect emotionally. So I was wondering, from your perspective, how is that um, serving us as a collective? Like, what is that teaching us? Is that, are they a more evolved I don't know if I want to use the word evolved, but kind of if you kind of see where I'm going, a version of like the human race, um, even though connection and, and empathy is, is, is a big part of us, but what is their, their conscious, what are they teaching us as a collective? I love it. <laughs> All right, so with, the, with Asperger's is on the autism spectrum, and anybody who's on the autism spectrum has come in for this purpose. Here's the major thing, which is why they kind of live in their own bubble. They are meant to basically teach you that your perspective is all that is operating in your reality. Meaning that you actually literally do live in a bubble called your reality and nobody else's reality is a part of it. So the only reason that you are in my reality is because I've created you. The only reason I'm in your reality is because you've created me. And once we understand that, we can prioritize ourselves so as to stop trying to pay attention to everyone else. See, we understand that what's causing us so much pain on this planet is the fact that when you say, oh, by the way, I think you should be doing your job differently, I go, shit, maybe I should. Right? That's a lot of pain. There's so much pain that there are beings who have volunteered to come down here and not be able to actually register that. So, my, my favorite joke is, you know, you want to figure out just what you actually feel like inside when somebody tells you to focus on something you don't want to focus on, then go interact with an autism, you know, somebody on the autism spectrum and tell them to focus on what you want them to focus on. I dare you. You're going to see poop smeared on the walls, you're going to see fits, you're going to see like an enormous amount of rebellion, because it is so unnatural, anything other than what makes us feel good as individuals. So if, if the problem with em empathy is that, and it's just a problem for right now, ultimately it's not going to be a problem. Once we all learn this, that, that we really need to be prioritizing how we feel and cut everyone else out of the equation, then we'll be able to actually have true empathy, where the empathy exists as a cohesive type of energy, and it, cre it, it sort of is serving the, the perspective of oneness, but at the same time is not damaging us to do this, right? But until that point, basically, what, what empathy does is it makes it so that you are now participating in creating my reality. That's what I'm making you do. Because if I care too much, if I'm able to feel what you feel so much, now I'm living my life at the mercy of trying to make you feel good just so I can make me feel good. Now, autism spectrum Asperger's is the exact opposite of that. It's, look, I'm so goddamn removed from your reality, I'm literally living in a damn bubble. And w and this is what they all say before they come in. We're going to start coming in in such high numbers that you can't get us to focus at something we don't want to focus at. And so when you can't get us to focus at something that you want us to focus at, suddenly it'll become frustrating to you because you can't get us to behave in a way that makes you feel good. And then you'll start prioritizing how you feel. We'll inspire you to be selfish enough that finally you'll be like, screw it, this is irritating me. I have to think about myself. Fine, I'm thinking about myself. Oh my gosh, guess what? Everything went better. And then these beings will come down and they will no longer you know, activate those genetics that create that kind of a disconnect so that we can be connected while simultaneously prioritizing our own perspective. Mm. <laughs> that is beautiful. <laughs> awesome.
awesome way to see it. Yeah, wow. And um, what about um, domestic violence, for example? I know that I know that in, in, in what we what we learn and in, in our world, as far as we create our own reality and where focus goes, energy flows. So it's like, okay, if you want something to change, don't give it, don't give attention to what you don't want. Give attention to what you do want. So I was watching another episode where it was about domestic violence, and you know they, they have you have organizations and stuff like that where people talk about their everything that they've gone through, and so they're spreading awareness. So is that because I can see both sides of the token? I see both perspectives on it. But can you give me a higher perspective as far as by them bringing light to the issue? Is that keeping it, or is that helping in a way? Because kind of this is sort of the problem here is that we like to this is another black or white question okay and the thing is is that we're teaching to people that are in a very different state so to one person hearing that information is going to cause them to activate that within them and thus it's going to propagate the problem for another person that awareness is going to be exactly what it takes for them to get outside the box enough to realize where they are and then to move in the direction of something that feels better and so somebody like me would say, put the information out there for this reason. Trust the people who are going to look at that to do what they need to do with that. To me, it's more important because we're worried more about the vibrations that are lower. We're worried more about the vibration of the person who has total lack of awareness of the situation they're in than the person who's going to look at it and feel bad for a minute. We would rather have somebody's attention be drawn to, and we don't ever want to leave it at, at what the problem is and not give solutions. That's our sort of issue. If we're going to focus on what the problem is so as to become aware, we have to switch quickly to what the solution would be and offer some vibration of what improvement would look like instead of just harp on how messed up the universe is. But I think that the, the step in, for so many people, the very first step is awareness. It's coming into a, a different perspective. And so putting that information out there and really being open with it, you can see the effect that has. I mean, it's not a joke. So here's this woman who turns on this radio program, of course, because what one of her guides or her vibration alone has led her to this radio station. She turns it on. Her husband's at work. You know, he's been beating the crap out of her. And she's listening to this other woman's account. And that's the first time in her life that she's really willing to admit that it's not her goddamn fault which is really where most people are. When they're in domestic violence, they're stuck in guilt, and that's what keeps them locked there. And so when they're starting to realize, you know, that this other person was stuck in guilt too, and that's what it is, it's guilt. It's not really that it's necessarily my fault that he beats me every night. And then maybe this person, because of that awareness, she can never go back to that same situation and feel the same. So she's already, by virtue of coming into awareness, changed her vibration. And now she's got to be thinking about how life could be different. And that's going to help her line up with different things. So so it is kind of like a very slippery slope, kind of a tightrope that we're walking. And we have to be very aware when we are speakers about these subjects, about which side we're teeter-tottering on. Are we teeter-tottering on the side of causing more contrast because all we're willing to do is sit here and yell about the problem? Or are we bringing up the problem so as to bring attention to it and shift it? You'll, you'll notice that because the people who are talking about domestic violence, who they can talk about unpleasant things, but you will have a different feeling about them. You'll sort of feel like, wow, this is an amazing talk, as opposed to somebody who's really stuck in it and really angry. It will not even feel good for you to listen to. Even though they have used the same words, they may be describing the exact same event, but the intention behind this person talking and that person talking is two different things. And so in that segue, where you just said something, when you said one person talking and, and it'll feel negative because they're still holding that, that energy, um, that brings a good topic because I wanted to ask you, I was having this conversation with my mother and I'm trying to get her to understand because she has a lot of health issues and, and she kind of understands this kind of create your reality half when she's in, when she's not. Sometimes she's like, ah, oh, this doesn't make sense. Um... <laughs> Because I get it, you don't you don't want to believe that all the bad stuff that has happened to you that you're bringing it on. So, um, but my mom has had a lot of health issues. But I'm trying to explain to her. I'm like, when she talks about things that have happened in her life or things that people have done, there's such a charged energy. And like like she talked about my my father. You know, it's been over 30 years. And I tell her when you talk about him, it's like 
It happened yesterday. You haven't seen the person in 30 years. You don't know how they change, but the energy is still the same. I'm like, that is causing. Do you not think that that is a buildup of festering energy? It's got to go somewhere. It's got to manifest into all these illnesses that she's had. And yep. my aunt was there, and she's like, well, well, how do you clear that out? Like, how do you, like, how do you let go of that? Like, all these resentments and issues and for somebody who doesn't have the perspective that we have on you create your reality like they kind of get it but not really i actually propose something which is quite different than a lot of teachers that way by virtue of of course going through that experience myself i've noticed that when you have a i call it a residual when you've got a residual vibration like that that's super super intense anything you do to focus positively is going to feel like varnish because so much of your being wants it out. And so what you have to do, basically, if you want to move past that, is go into it. That means that this person needs to go into a catharsis. They should be applauded in their, in their harping on it. And what's, what's interesting is that from the outside, a lot of the times the people that just can't let go of things have the biggest guilt complexes. I know your mother's no exception. So these people are the people that if you were to put on goggles, the goggles I have, right? Okay, so let's put on teal goggles for a minute. What it looks like is that the whole time that this person is going over the experience, every other thought, they're guilting themselves about it. So so it looks kind of interesting, you know, somebody like me working with them. I would be like, get angry. Come on. I want more of it. Pretend I'm him, literally. I, I literally want you to go so deep into this that you feel so mad that you can hardly contain it. And so we're encouraging something which has never been encouraged before, not even by her. And so you'll notice that the per, once the permission is there for that shit to come out, it's kind of like she's finally able to vomit. So I like to think about these residual vibrations that are really festering within. It's kind of like a bacterial infection in the stomach. And so you're puking up just a little bit each day then it grows again throughout the night. But if you would just allow yourself to literally throw the whole damn thing up at once, or, you know, over a process of a, a week or a month, and literally let yourself go there 100%, then there would be nothing else that would come up. And a person would move very quickly into the next vibration up from that. But it, this is where it sort of doesn't work for a lot of us who are in Mind Creates Reality thing, because we we're too, yet again, black and white about it. Because we say, anytime you focus on anything, you, you, you basically reinforce the vibration, so don't do that. Which is true, you reinforce the vibration, but we could reinforce the vibration for a second so as to get to a better feeling space about that. Or we could go on just feeding it and feeding it and feeding it for 20 years, just a little bit. <laughs> I'm a major, major, major supporter of shadow work. Obviously, that's like my number one thing, because it's what works the best. I know that personally. The more that you allow yourself to go to these really, really dark spaces, and the more you allow yourself to act completely insane, the better you get. <laughs> So, so, it's, so what I'm saying is we get into trouble because those of us who go up to people like that and say, don't do it, don't think about it, quit thinking that, you're creating it when you're thinking it, you're, you're actually committing the same crime again to these people. You're saying, look, it's not appropriate to, for you to feel the way you feel, because that's the only message your mom receives, by the way. The only thing she's hearing when you say that is, you shouldn't be feeling this way, and what you're doing is mirroring her own guilt, that's why you can even say that to her. She's a match to you saying that or to hearing that from other people because she feels guilty for the way she feels. I'm trying to explain that, like, you've never, I promise you, you've never seen your mother get to the place where she's talked about it enough. No, you're for right. For her. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right because I feel like she's so, like, doesn't want to go there. Like, she has so, but that's, yep. and that's what the one thing I told her. I said, you don't haven't cleared it up, but because you don't want to go there. Like, even when my brother and yep. her have resistance, but I'm like, you got to talk about it, but then it's yeah. like, if they don't want to talk about it, so it's just like, <coughs> how do you... Then let out? the universe take care of it, because they will force the issue. Okay. This is this is sort of the fun of being in this situation, is the universe absolutely loves you, it's a giant mirror, and so it will definitely force you to go there. One way or the other, she'll be forced to go there. So that's where you find yourself in these sort of awkward crossroads situations, and there's a lot of beautiful stuff that comes out of those, even though they're uncomfortable as hell. 
But if your mother was allowing herself to go to these spaces, you wouldn't. You would, it's like we don't even have to take initiative. Right. So we get worried. We're like, oh my goodness! Now we have to make sure that they're focusing positively after they focus negatively. No, it naturally happens. All you're doing is clearing the cobwebs out of the service, and then pretty soon you go over to your mom's house and she's happy for once, and you're like, what the hell happened? I don't even know who this person is. Oh, I joined a young class. <laughs> Ah, oh, you're awesome. <laughs> um, is there is there anything uh, um, that you would like to touch on? Um, anything you want your fans to know? I know they have so much of your content, but for anybody who is not familiar um, with a lot of your work, I'm going to put some of your um, links and videos on the site. Um, so I just wanted this to be more for your current fans who already know you and. Um, I've had fun having a conversation with you, even though it wasn't so structured, but... <laughs> oh, I like unstructured conversations. See, it wouldn't be a fun thing to listen to the same radio show too many times in a row. I always love it when there's different hosts that are asking different questions. <laughs> and I'm never going to stop producing content. At least I don't think. As of right now, my vibration is in a space where I'm never going to stop producing content, so there's only going to be more and more. That's awesome. You, you're gonna be you're gonna be in London soon, right? November. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. And then you, I heard, I saw one of your other recent interviews. So you have another book that you just wrote, you finished a while ago. Uh, self love, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Are you gonna self publish that, or are you gonna wait? Because I know how you feel mm -hmm. about self publishing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I couldn't self-publish it even if I wanted to right now because I signed a contract with a a book agent. Oh, okay. So it's in her hands whether that goes to a publisher or not, and we've been looking for publishers and looking for publishers, and we haven't found one that is a good fit yet. So, so what are your thoughts I'm, on that within yourself? <sighs> I hate publishers, okay? That is my major issue. I've got like a ser I'm trying to use a business that I hate. That's my issue right now. I'm having a very hard time, if you want to know why I'm a match to this, I'm having a very hard time pulling myself into alignment with that business because it is so corrupt and it is such bullshit. Oh my gosh. So yeah, I'm going to have to focus differently towards it. But <laughs> See, and the other thing I have to say that I love about you, what makes you so like just relatable, is because this, this is the stuff. It's like sometimes you can go on that whole people are really spiritual and they try to perceive this. And... You're just, you're just you, you know, you curse, you, you know, you have this cute thing about you and you're super wise and beautiful, you're quirky, like, it's just you. And um, it just makes you so relatable. <laughs> I'm glad someone likes it, it's nice for exchange. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's awesome, it really is, because um, that's actually, that's, that's one of the things, because uh, even with the channelers, like, I've watched um, Abraham and I, and I like their work and stuff like that. But I think what makes you such a such a match with our consciousness who's asked for you is for that because it's like you're relatable. You're young and you're so young. I can't believe how young you are. Because I'm only I'm 27. You're 29. When I think about it, I'm like, oh my god. Because you're so ahead. Of course, you came in like that. But I'm talking from a human perspective. <laughs> Do you find that difficult? Like I find sometimes I talk from like human perspective and then different and it's kind of like I had a friend who would always be like you're so weird because I talk in eyes wheeze and then me do you, you switch a lot from different perspectives I switch all the time from that to that it's just because when you're when you're able to take on different perspectives then it gets difficult to really identify with yourself as much as most people identify with one identity mm -hmm. so you feel more like a mutable creature that is that here's this perspective that's part of the collective conscious, then here's this perspective that's totally down in the ego, and so you'll start to switch around in terms of the way you even feel relative to yourself. It's really, really common, and you watch it a lot when you get into the spiritual circle, so it doesn't surprise me that you have that same condition. I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I guess since we're talking, just two more questions. Um, how, has, how are you now, like, as far as, like, I know that with um, women, I mean, it's different now, you're in a different space. Um, but <laughs> I know, because I was like that, and now I'm in a different space, but, like, how is your relationship as far as, like, friendships with women, and 
and I know that you, I, I read one of <coughs> one of the videos you mentioned, you had a friend that you, you're not used to like talking about your problems, like you, you, you deal with them on your own, but now I know you mentioned with the, the one girl, what's your, your, what's her name? Um, Graciela. Graciela. Um, it feels like you have a bond with her, so do you feel like you've shifted, like you've opened more um, in that perspective? I have. It's definitely been a, a yeah. <laughs> uh, I, God, I don't even know what to say about that. I feel. I feel like I just. It's more that I've been not not as much as doing serious work. It's just becoming aware of the fact that I walk into relationships specifically with women with this attitude of they're going to screw me over. And so they always do in some way or another. And just realizing that, I mean, even feeling the way that I feel when a man enters the room versus when a woman enters the room, I'm starting to realize, wow, this is a fabulous setup for a good relationship, you know? Because, <laughs> like, they come in the room and I'm instantly, like, my, my joke with my ex-husband used to be that, you know, I'm this, like, super reserved, super wise person. And so, like, a guy walks in the room and I'm, like, I am able to take over the space and be super confident. A girl walks in the room and I'm like a damn Labrador retriever. It's like my tail's going and I'm like, eh, 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 eh. You know, because like on one hand I'm so damn excited to have a relationship, but I don't know how to have a relationship with women because it's like, you know, it's it's hard to have relationships when you don't understand what another person's getting out of the relationship. And I feel like a lot of, a lot, it's not just sexually abused women, but like women in general, I think we feel so much like a lot of our value lies in our sexuality that some of us have a very hard time understanding what other women are getting out of being around us. And <laughs> I'm definitely one of those. So when I don't understand what somebody's getting out of being around me, I don't understand what, what to offer them. So I start to feel powerless about the relationship and desperate. And then I don't, I'm like doing all kinds of like extravagant things to try to get them to like me more because I, I feel like they're going to abandon me if I don't. And then it just gets to be this super uncomfortable relationship. And there's always been super jealousy issues relative to relationships that I've been in too, especially because of the way that I wield my power around men. That's never really popular, you know. It's kind of hard when you get with certain women to, you know, dress like you normally would. And for me, that's like super sexy outfits. And I can't tell because I'm in spiritual mode, but like, you know, my idea of an awesome outfit, and anybody who's run into me in the weekend will tell you what the hell, you know, because I'm like, I'm in like push-up bra, Victoria's Secret mini dresses with like stiletto high heels. I love that. So it gets really hard, though, to go out in outfits like that with girls that feel sort of crappy about themselves and to have the relationship go good afterwards when you're the one getting all the attention from men. So, and I feel like women are kind of in competition with each other because the mainstream media pits us that way. I mean, it's kind of hard when everybody's being compared to everyone else and there's this ideal you have to fit to appreciate the individual beauty of one woman versus another woman, especially when you're more the stereotype that society finds attractive. So, yeah, I, I've been... No, it's sort of like noticing these patterns has put me in a, a different vibrational space where I'm realizing where I am relative to women so as to kind of catch myself in the act when I feel that desperate. And what's interesting is I, I've attracted... You know, this, this girl, Graciela, who I've attracted, is just like a gift from God. I can't even tell you. She, of course, I, I had this really close friend that ended up leaving, and it's like the doorway opened up, and she walked into it. And it, it works like that when you create voids in your life, right? And it's so funny because, ironically, the demographic of people that I've had the most difficult time with by virtue of being abused in my childhood so much was the Hispanic population, and, of course, Graciela comes in, and she's Hispanic, right? Like, her parents are so Mexican. And it's like she's been rehabilitating me in terms of feeling more confident with that culture. And on top of that, like, you know, she's somebody who feels really terrible about the way that she looks. You know, she's overweight. And she's she would be, normally, you know, I thought our relationship was going to be terrible because she would be the kind of person who most people would think there would be a major jealousy issue and we'd not get along. Ironically, she's like... She goes, Teal, I'm always best friends with the pretty girls. Why? Because I like to hide. And I'm like, what do you mean you like to hide? And she's like, well, if you're the one everyone's looking at, nobody's looking at me. I get to hide. And it's like, it's, this, it's so bizarre because I would usually expect her to be completely hating me, but she is the exact opposite. It's like, 
you know, when I get all dressed up, she's like, oh, you look gorgeous, you know, and, and I can watch her vibration. She's not even kidding about it. And she's been the person. Ironically, that's usually men for me that I go to support from, but it's this weird feeling because I'm like, oh, God, I'm getting support because I give you something, which is my sexuality, right? So now I'm in this relationship, which is scaring the Christ out of me, which is awesome for me that it's scaring me, though, because now, like, she's my number one support right now. She's the person in my life right now where it's like if I, if I fall apart, I want her around me and I'm getting the support from somebody and what I'm giving her is not sexuality, it's just my presence and it's really rehabilitatory for me, super. So it's been, I'm obviously improving something. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. And mm -hmm. it's so crazy because I just have to make this reference like as you were saying that, I feel like um, we're like the yin and the yang because that my my best friend actually my first first real friend is is really overweight and it's the first real friend i've ever had because i had that growing up and my thing was like i was always friends and my friends were always like i remember i had a friend who broke up with me our friendship <laughs> she, she wrote me a letter in high school and was like i can't be your friend anymore because i feel like i'm in competition with you and i was like who's in competition i never saw it like that and so that was my thing. I was always more friends with guys, and I just felt like I had to sh hide my light, and I wasn't doing anything. But then I realized it was, it was their own stuff. And then when I started switching, um, but I had the same thing that happened to you. I had a best friend who came into my life in like uh, in the tenth grade, going into eleventh. And you would, I would think that it would. I thought the same thing. I was like, I would think it was the opposite, but it's the first and only true friend I've had for it's been eleven years, and unconditional love she has supported me loves me never there's never been one ounce of jealousy and it was the most refreshing and since that friendship so i see that with you because i feel like now that you have that it's just going to open the door for now real floods of real people coming in real women because that's what happened yeah. when she came into my experience all the women that have that have come in have been real but it was like she yeah. had to come in to teach me that unconditional love and support and it's, it's such an amazing feeling so i'm really happy for you oh good i'll look forward to that see you're ahead of me in that respect i'm pretty excited that i'm like like right there at the beginning of this <laughs> it's, yep. it's gonna be awesome and you're amazing and um for taking the time to to chat with me i i enjoyed it this was a super fun one <laughs>